you all very much. Uh, thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure uh, to be uh, with you. I look forward to working with you, working with you today. Um, let's talk about the um, the objectives that we have. Uh, let's see. Um, and let me lay out for you what the central proposition central proposition is. So the central, the central argument is that uh, connecting uh, what is politically acceptable uh, with what is administratively sustainable is the essential prerequisite for effective governance. When we talk about political acceptability, we're talking about the what is it that we want to do, the what part. We're talking about administrative sustainability. We're talking about how do we do it? How do we do it effectively? How do we do it effectively over, over time? It's getting more difficult to bridge this gap. And new ways of looking at your work are the result of the broadening of the gap, the space between these two arenas of politics and administration. My own sense is that as you, as you move more towards, towards the um, office of the chief administrative officer, that your ability to do your technical work will become just a threshold qualification. That at some point, as you move up the ladder, the value added is the ability to work the space between political and administrative arenas, and I call that space the gap. In order to do this, in my scheme of things, it takes uh, political astuteness, something I call political astuteness. That astuteness has two prongs. The first is captured in objective number two, which is discussion of the choices um, among politics is the choice among conflicting and uh, conflicting values. And the takeaway there is an understanding that within the political realm, if the goal is building and maintaining a sense of community, that efficiency is only one of four uh, conflicting values. So if the, the person who doesn't understand where efficiency falls in that scheme of things is one who is bound to be frustrated. The second aspect of political astuteness is the idea that even though elected officials and people like yourselves use the same words to communicate, you're actually speaking a different language. The, the inability to understand the language or the, or the inability to, um, to understand the logic of politics if you're staff or the logic of administration if you're, if you're an elected official puts you at a disadvantage. The value added is the person who can translate, who can translate the world of politics into the world of administration, who can translate the world of administration into the world of politics. And finally, and very briefly, we'll talk about some names for some of these roles. And I must say that um, all of this is in flux. And it's in flux because whether you realize it or not, you are part of a great experiment. You are living a life administratively uh, where both political and administrative arenas are in a lot of flux. And we're watching you. Um, we're watching you to see what you do successfully. And so that we can trans take, take that, take, the, take, take what you're doing, and then put them into, put that, put that work into words and concepts that we can share more broadly. And so the idea of political astuteness and looking at the values and looking at the logic is um, something that I have seen in your world, you all, um, you all do. Okay, let's start with an example. Let's say um, that city council, 
City Council is on board with the uh, construction uh, of a new rec center. And it's going to be a big one. It's going to be cool. And um, they're under the impression that the community is uh, supporting supporting the proposition. And uh, so they've, uh, they've had the community discussions, and they're, they're on board. Um, they want to, uh, want to issue bonds uh, to build the uh, facility. And uh, in order to gain the legitimacy uh, for the project, they want to have a public vote. They're confident that the public vote will, uh, will, will then uh, give them the permission to issue, issue the bonds. During the discussion, however, and leading up to the vote, a few things emerge, one of which is the city's going to have to use uh, land that it doesn't own. It's going to have to purchase, uh, purchase the land in order to have a spot centrally located so that the whole community would have access to this one-of-a-kind, wonderful, wonderful facility. The cost of the facility starts to raise some hackles. Uh, so it's not only that it's not going to be done on city land, but the price is, uh, is going to be significant. And so what started out as kind of a no-brainer here now becomes a controversial, a controversial issue. So the council asked the staff to uh, project um, uh, not only the costs of uh, the capital costs, but also the operating costs. And staff comes back with a report on the operating costs. And the council comes up with an ingenious idea that it thinks will uh, tip the scales in favor of the public vote. And what they say is, um, to each other, they propose, they say, how about if at a council meeting, we each take a pledge. We each pledge that if the people authorize the bonds, that we will use the money just for capital expenses, and that user fees will be charged for the operating expenses. And we've seen the user fee schedule. We think that would be appropriate. They go to the public vote, and it wins by the barest margin. It's commonly assumed that the pledge was the tipping point. They start now uh, to uh, take, a, take a more thorough look at the site, and um, actually start to do a little more engineering work on the site, and they discover some anomalies. The, anomaly, the anomalies are not going to affect the capital costs, but they are going to affect the operating costs. They ask the staff for a, a new user fee schedule, and it comes back higher than originally anticipated. Now they're stuck. They have the pledge that their user fees will pay for the, um, pay for the operating costs but we now have a new proposed user fee schedule. The question is, will the user fee schedule be politically acceptable, knowing that it will be administratively sustainable? The night that the council is supposed to vote, uh, and they actually are going to vote on the acceptance of the user fees, the night that they are prepared to vote, the room is filled. Fifteen members of an ecumenical clergy come up one by one and they say to the council, if you adopt this user fee, you will systematically deprive the poor children in our neighborhood for using this wonderful facility, the same facility that many of their parents voted for. Now, if you were a council member, what would you do? Is there a correct answer to this problem in the sense of 2 plus 2 equals 4? No. This is a problem where after all the facts are known, we can still disagree on what we ought to do. After all the facts are known, we can still disagree on what we ought to do. And you know what we do under those conditions? We do politics. 
That's what we do. We do politics to try to develop a sense of we're in a situation now, for some people it's politically acceptable to go ahead, we live with the pledge, for others it's not politically acceptable, and now we've got to work to see if we can come to some, to some agreement. Okay, so now that I've given you an example of how that works and how we're now going to have this discussion of political acceptability, um, we had a discussion of administrative sustainability, but it may no longer be acceptable, so we're having that discussion again. We're having a discussion between the two to come up with a way to make this thing, make this thing work. So now let's look at the gap in a, more, in a more conceptual way. So what we have is, on this, uh, on this graphic, is um, we have two axes. And uh, the, first, the first is um, learning, high and low. And what I mean by this is accumulated learning, learning over time. Time is on the uh, bottom uh, dimension here. And you can see how precise I am. Uh, I don't exactly know when now is, but I know, I don't exactly know when then was, but I know it was before now. So um, what the proposition here is that if you compare the learning curve of elected officials with the learning curve of people like yourself, you have learned over time far more about how to do your work effectively than elected officials have done compared to your predecessors and then compared to their predecessors. Now, initially, initially, we tried to separate the spheres of politics and administration in order to develop integrity of analytical thinking and professionalism. And this largely took place at the end of the 1800s and into the 1900s. And the whole notion of professionalism in local government, council, the form of council manager government itself is a product of this reform movement that was designed to separate the worlds of politics and administration. Civil service systems that we still have is, is in many ways a, a, a very graphic illustration of that separation. Hire the best that you can and then protect them from inappropriate political intrusion in order that they may speak the truth to power. The truth that is built out of analysis to the power that comes from political, political authority. But as I said in the beginning, the essential prerequisite is connecting the two. So we have to be able to have the integrity of each sphere, but not so isolated that it becomes such an incredible challenge to make the connection. Because it's only, again, if we make the connection that we can get something done. But as the gap increases, making the connection becomes more difficult. Now, if we do not make the connection, then what happens is a loss of trust in governing institutions, a loss of credibility, and that phrase that we've heard over and over again recently, they can't get anything done. There is nothing more condemning of a, of, a, of, a, of a governing institution than they cannot get anything done. Why is the gap growing? Administrative modernization. Better tools. You have far better tools than your predecessor. Can you even imagine doing the work you do without something like Excel? See, I mean, it's, it's now beyond imagination of what must they have done? How could they have done the things that we, well, they didn't do the things you do now. 
They couldn't do the things that you do now. You do far more analytical work. You have better tools. You have, you have opportunities if you take them. You have opportunities to learn what is happening in your field, not only all over this country, but all over the world. And I guarantee you that the best things that you are doing in North Carolina are probably very similar to the best things that are being done in Melbourne or in Berlin or in London, okay? Now, what other advantage that you have over the elected officials is you have systematic ways of conveying knowledge from one generation to the next. That's what, that's what a university education is about. If you go to engineering school, you are taught by engineers. They are bringing to you the knowledge of their generation and the research that you are doing so that you systematically learn up from your predecessors. And you come to conferences like this and you have professional uh, requirements for continuing ed credits in some fields and so on and so forth. There are all those things that are built into uh, built into the notion of adding to your capacity. And what happens is the result is the learning curve accelerates. And you're like this compared to your predecessors. Now compare what I just said to the world of the elected official. The work of today's elected officials is more difficult. The problems are more challenging. There is virtually no desire to learn from their predecessors, unless they're the same party, right? Do you know any other job where people think experience isn't valued? Think about it. Oh, you've been in too long. You stood for two terms, you need to get out. Hello? What happened to the experience? We devalue it, okay? Most importantly, there is no systematic way of conveying the skills and the talent of legislating from one generation to the next, okay? Unless we're talking about partisan politics and parties and so on and so on and so forth. And even then I have my doubts. Add to that the politics of identity, which seem to be pervasive, not only in this country, but throughout the world. The politics of identity make compromise very, very difficult. And so what we get is simplistic, ideological positions that are juxtaposed against the sophistication of the analytical work that you are doing. And what happens is the gap grows. So in order for us to work the gap effectively, it takes an understanding of what the heck is going on in that territory, okay? And the idea here is that the chief administrative officer, whether it be uh, in a city or whether it be in a county, if that person is a professional, that person understands that working in the gap is part of his or her job. That's what he or she does for a significant portion of his or her time. And as you, as that person, moves up the ladder and aspires to that position, he or she is attuned to learning from others who do working the gap well. But if you don't necessarily have aspirations to be the chief administrative officer, you may look at other models, okay, for experiences that you think will be of value to you because you don't anticipate having to work the gap. But lo and behold, what I think is happening 
is that the chief administrative officer, as the gap increases, it becomes overwhelming. And what happens is, we change from a concept of the management team, we now call ourselves a leadership team. What is the difference? Why don't, are they synonyms? Are they synonyms for you? Or do they convey a little bit of a different meaning? And for me, they do. For me, the concept of a leadership team means that we are together and you are helping me, Chief Administrative Officer, work the gap. But in order to do that, you need to be politically astute. I don't need people who say, oh, that's just the governing body. Oh, that's just politics. Oh, that's just what they want to do. No. Or the worst of all, why don't they just do the right thing? Okay. Now that I've got you a little bit upset, let me talk a little bit about political astuteness. Understanding that politics is about conflicting, conflicting values. Okay? Let's start there. I already told you that the definition of a political problem is one where after all the value, all the, uh, all the, uh, all the facts are known, we can still uh, disagree over what we ought to do. Driving these kinds of problems, like the problem of the rec center that I just gave, are conflicting values. And this is what makes achieving political acceptability so challenging. So let's take a look at these four values. Representation, participation, efficiency, professionalism, equity, and individual rights. Now, I did not make up these values. These values are at the core of governing, of democratic governing institutions. Every single one of them can be traced to some theoretical premise behind the notion of democracy. Okay? So the value of representation is captured in the notion that of the pledge in, in the case. See, why would the pledge be so important? See, why wouldn't the council just say, oh yeah, we took the pledge, but that was then. Now the user fees are going to go up. We have to do something about that. We have to use some of the other expenses to pay for the user fees because we can't. And I know we took the pledge, but forget about it. How do you feel about that governing body? Where's their integrity? Would you trust them the next time? They are representatives. You trust them to be representatives and to speak the truth, the truth to you. In that, in that sense, with that value, I also add participation and engagement to, uh, to, to, to broaden it. The second value is the value of efficiency, and I try there to broaden that as well so that it means more than money. In the case, of, in the rec center case, the value of efficiency is reflected in the calculation of the user fee, the calculation of the capital cost, and so on, and so on, and so forth. I broaden that value as well to include professionalism, because what I'm trying to say here is that this value captures the, 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 the uh, emphasis that we place on rational analytical thinking, okay? The idea that a council would listen and read a report that you have prepared stems from their respect for the value of rational analytical thinking and research that you do. Okay? It is not easy to dismiss as long as you believe in this value as a fundamental value. The value of equity is captured in the notion of what those clergy said. Now those clergy is very interesting um, in terms of the scheme of the values because on the one hand, the clergy are proposing to represent the group of citizens 
who are not speaking for themselves, who have a, uh, who are going to find themselves in uh, this uh, difficult, difficult position of not being able to afford, afford the user fees, and to be then in that case systematically, if unintendedly, discriminated, discriminated against. But what gives those clergy the power of their argument is not just their role as representatives, but the argument that they're making, which is anchored in the value of social equity. The value of social equity in our society is very, very important. And when you can, when you can frame an argument in, in terms of efficiency or in terms of equity or in terms of individual rights, it gives your argument added power because those values, we all recognize that those values, those values are fundamental. Okay, what do we learn from this? One, we cherish each value, but nobody told you you cannot have all four optimally at the same time. I'm telling you now. Okay? You cannot have all four optimally at the same time. You can try, but it isn't going to work. Okay? And that's why traditionally politics has been called the art of negotiation and compromise because there are no correct answers and it leads to the second learning from the work with the values, which is no one value profile is objectively the best. It depends on your political philosophy. And it depends on whether community is what you have at heart. Third, efficiency is one of four values. If you do not accept that, if the technical staff does not accept that, I guarantee you, you will be frustrated. It's a guarantee. And last, ignoring any of the values over any long period of time will come back to haunt you. And if you don't believe that, you haven't been watching television. Ferguson, Missouri, okay? Ignoring any one of the values over time will come back to haunt you. Now, the Ferguson case is very, very interesting in a number of ways because what it illustrates is that the values themselves can be conveyed politically in anecdotes, in pictures, and in stories. See, we don't have to sit down and have this analytical discussion about values for the values to become part of the political agenda. All we have to do is to see some pictures. And those pictures then raise in our minds some of these fundamental values that we grew up with and that we understand. And it raises a sense of it raises a sense of concern. Now, it raises a sense of concern, but the same level of concern for all of us? No, of course not, because we put different emphasis on the different values, and that's the beauty of a political philosophy. Okay. All right. Next, um, I'm going to show you this very quickly. Uh, this is not a very good illustration of what I want to convey, but what I'm trying to say is here we have the efficacy of a solution that is being proposed. High and low doesn't, I don't know what high and low means. What I meant to say is a lot of options, a few options. In other words, are there a lot of options available to solve the problem? Or are there a few options available to solve the problem? 
If there are a few, only a few options available to solve the problem. In other words, if you say, this is what we recommend, and we really don't recommend anything else, what you are telling the council is you can't do politics. The politics have been done for you. Now, in some cases, the council will be thankful, okay? Because they really don't want to get into it. But in other cases, what you might be doing is suppressing a political discussion that is going to erupt in another way, in another venue, because it needs to be heard. So that if there are, as you can imagine, if it says you could do A or you could do B or you could do C, what you now have done is said to the council, you can do politics now. And the politics will determine A, B, or C, all of which are politically, are administratively sustainable. So go do your politically acceptable work, okay? All right. Now, let's talk about the constellations of logic. And this is the second, this is the second um, aspect of what I consider political students. Now, when you look at this chart, what I've got up here is the world of politics, the world of administration. I have administrative sustainability here, political acceptability here, and this is the gap. And you can see the CAO, City or County Administrator, and senior staff, so I put the senior staff in the gap and working both sides. The characteristics over here, I've got a series of characteristics that I'm going to go through so that we can make the contrast. Now when I make the comparison and the contrast, I want you to think about um, Chicago politics. And I want you to think about really technically trained staff. Okay, so let's, let's draw sharp distinctions knowing that there are <clears throat> those are, part of, are artificial, but I want to make a sharp distinction so that I can so that I can um, so that I can make make a few points here. So, for example, on the first line, what we have is the activity, and the activity on the administrative side, the primary activity is problem solving. If you don't have a problem to deal with, you might as well be on vacation. Your work is centered around problems to be solved. And this is why when you get vague direction, what happens? A level of frustration sets in. Why don't they just decide what they want to have done? Well, because they can't decide, okay? All right, all right. But it's problem solving. Now, on the political side, you could say it's problem solving, but I like to say the work is the allocation of values. <laughs> so that when a governing body passes some legislation, what is embodied in that legislation is a set of values. So for example, The Americans with Disabilities Act has two fabulous phrases, okay? Reasonable accommodation and undue hardship. Does anybody have any idea what those two words mean? I guarantee you when that legislation was passed, they didn't know what it meant. It was only after the administrative regulations were written it was only after, only after court case after court case that we started to learn what those terms meant. But here's what we do know. 
Reasonable accommodation was a tribute to the value, grew out of the value of individual rights. Undue hardship grew out of the value of efficiency. And so what we have embodied in this piece of legislation is an attempt to capture and capture in a way that makes it work values of individual rights for the disabled, but still a concern for the efficiency of the workplace. And that's what we do when we legislate. We legislate political philosophies, and those political philosophies are built on a ranking of the political, political values. However, not all of politics can be seen as either problem solving or the allocation of values. To some extent, you can only understand politics if you look at it as a game. Now when I say a game, I don't mean fun and games. What I mean is, it's an activity that has its own rules. And if you don't understand the rules, you get very frustrated as a council member and maybe as an observer. For example, on a five-member council, if there is one person who is in the minority, and it's going to be four to one, and everybody knows it's going to be four to one, the one, the rule is, the one can say outrageous things. It's a rule, okay? There's another rule, however, that if that one is going to be a swing vote, and that one says the same outrageous things, immediately loses the respect of the other council members. The rule is that if you're the swing vote, you have to be able to articulate in a reasonable fashion why you are moving in this direction or this direction. If you don't, you lose the respect of the other council members. And Jim Oliver, who was the city manager in Norfolk, when I was doing this work for him years ago, he reminded me, he said, John, what council members don't understand is that if they want to get something done, it takes a majority, and their most important constituent is not the people who voted for them, it's the other council members. And they have to understand that when they are talking on that dais, they are not just talking to the television. They are not just talking to the people in the audience. They are talking to the other members of the governing body. And they have to talk to them in ways that earn respect if they want to be respected as well. There are other rules. You don't have to speak on every issue. It, you should, if an issue is voted on, you are supposed to let the issue die. Those who keep bringing up the issue over and over again, again, issues of respect. Okay. Second, and I'm not gonna go through all these, I'm just gonna go through the ones that I like to go through. Um, no, I actually didn't mean to say that. I mean, the ones that <laughs> <laughs> um, experts do the problem solving. Okay? So you're the experts, you do the problem solving. So I'm trying to build a logical set here. Over here, they're not experts doing the allocation of value and playing the game, they're representatives. Now, think about this. Here we give a governing body, elected officials, some of the most profound responsibility that a person can have in a community, allocating values for that community, helping to build, maintain, and preserve a sense of community. What are the prerequisites for getting elected? What are the knowledge, skills, and abilities that are prerequisites? There are none. Somebody screwed up. 
Some democratic theorists must have screwed up <coughs> during that plan. How could this be? Ah, there's an answer, okay? The answer is found in an analogy. Let's say that you have a problem with your shoulder. You can raise your arm to full extension, but with excruciating pain. So it's painful from here to here. It's excruciatingly painful to get any further, the full, full, uh, full extension. You go to a general practitioner who refers you to an expert, an orthopedic surgeon. The orthopedic surgeon refers you to another expert who will conduct an MRI and who will read the MRI and prepare a report. Have you ever read the report, by the way? Have you, can you understand a single word in that report? No, see, the, these, see, the, and this, the, it, it gives you, it gives you clues, see, about professional communities. Seeing how esoteric the professional communities are, the language that they use in order to convey information from, um, from, one, from one to the other. So that what happens is when the orthopedic surgeon gets the uh, information back from the radiologist, then the orthopedic surgeon now has to translate for you, right, and tell you what the situation is. So the orthopedic sa surgeon says, you've got a severe rotator cuff problem. Now, there are two alternatives. Here's what we can do. I can give you some medication, and we can do some therapy, and the, the pain that you feel from here to here will be reduced. It won't go away completely, but it will be reduced, and you can be confident about that. If you need full extension, I'm sorry to say you're going to have to live with the pain. It'll be okay from here to here, but from here to here, it's going to be the same. Alternatively, what I can do for you is I can get rid of, I can do an operation. I can get rid of all the pain from here to here but you will not be able to raise your arm beyond that point. Do you understand the alternatives? Yes, I understand the alternatives. What do you think I ought to do, doctor? Now, what's the doctor say to the patient? I haven't got a clue. <clears throat> Now, why won't, why won't the doctor make a recommendation? Because it's your life. The doctor can't judge for you what's more important, pain or mobility. Only you can make that judgment. Making that judgment about pain or mobility has absolutely nothing to do with whether or not you can understand the nitty gritty of the operation itself. In other words, you don't have to understand the nuts and bolts of the recommendation in order to make a reasoned choice. What you have to be able to understand is the consequences associated with the alternatives. And that's why when you prepare a staff report, if you expect counsel to understand the nitty gritty of the staff report the same way you do, you are abusing your position. What you have to help them understand is if you do this, this is what we think will occur. If you do this, this is what we think will occur. Now you are the elected representatives to decide which is preferable for the community. Okay? All right. Let's take a look at the next one. 
What do you hear? What do you know? What do you know invites data, plans, and reports? Okay? What do you hear invites passion, dreams, and stories? The passion, um, I'm indebted to the uh, city manager in Des Moines, Eric Anderson, for this. The passion is essential because the passion activates the process. The dreams are what help us understand the aspirations for the community. And the stories are the anecdotes which convey the values and help us understand and capture what it is that we ought to be doing. Now, we can see that there can be all the data plans and reports in the world that um, come to bear on a proposition but if you're in Ferguson, Missouri, what prevails? Passion, dreams, and stories. So that our challenge, and the challenge that is set out for us, is how do we insert data plans and reports to some way counterbalance the passion, dreams, and stories, so they don't, so that we don't run off on some extreme venture, and that will be the political task that is ahead of us, not only in Ferguson, Missouri, but I think for a lot of other places in this country as well. Now, it is interesting for me that when I say passion, dreams, and stories, I don't mean to imply that every politician has to be able to be passionate, or has to be able to dream, or has to be able to tell good stories. Because I'm reminded of um, an incident I had after I had gotten elected, and um, one of my, uh, my chief advisors, he said to me, John, I want to tell you something about governing. He said, um, there are going to be times when you're up on the podium, or you're up on the dais, and you are going to be no more than a ventriloquist dummy. And I said, Dan, what are you telling me? He said, what's going to happen is you're going to open your mouth and other people's words are going to come out that you have heard, that you have talked to. And lo and behold, it's exactly what happened. When I ran in 1991, there was a group of uh, there was a group of uh, parents who had swimmers, um, young swimmers, um, who there wasn't enough pool space, and they were getting up at five o'clock in the morning. And many, of you, perhaps some of you, have done, done all this, and it was really kind of a hectic, hectic uh, schedule. And they wanted to know whether or not I would endorse um, more um, more um, uh, room uh, or uh, another aquatic center. And I said, I certainly am not opposed to it, but it's not going to be part of my campaign. But if it comes up, I'll support it. Well, that was good enough for them, and they supported me in my campaign. Later on in that first term in office, I got frustrated with the, the uh, bunch of stuff that was going on in Parks and Rec. And finally, one night, I said, do we have a Parks and Recreation master plan out of frustration? And Parks and Rec guy said, yeah, we do, but it's out of date. And I said, well, I'm tired of all these bits and pieces coming to us. Are there, th are there two other council members who would like to, uh, like to direct staff to uh, prepare a new Parks and Recreation Master Plan? And yeah, sure, fine. OK, so now we got three votes for a new Parks and Recreation Master Plan. And then guess what was the next thing out of my mouth? Are there two other people who have heard about the difficulties that the swimmers in our town have? And uh, can we direct staff to pay particular attention to including, um, analyzing and including the possibility of a aquatic center in the master plan? Yeah, sure, let's do that. Now, whose passion just got unleashed? All the swimmers' parents who were watching on television. Once they heard that, their passion, their dreams, their stories were now going to take, going to take effect. 
So it was the legitimacy of the office itself that gave permission for the story to be, to be, to be propagated. Let's go down, let's go down here to power and uh, knowledge, the currency. The currency of the elected official is power. Now what does power mean? Power <coughs> means people listen when you talk as an elected official. That's what it means. When you talk, do people listen? On the other side, it's not what you say, it's what you have accomplished. That's why you have a resume and I, as an elected official, do not. What have you done? Now, there's another interesting little story here. The same guy, um, my friend Dan, who was real political, I came to him six months after uh, the first, first, first uh, time in office. I came to him six months later, and I said, uh, Dan, these tax abatements are really good to me. He said, I'm not up for it at all. I said, I know I said I was for it in the campaign, but uh, you know, six months in, and I don't think I can vote for it again. And he said, you don't have the credibility to change your mind. And I looked at him, and I said, what? What are you talking about? He said, you haven't been in office enough and long enough the people have built trust and credibility in you. If you change your mind now, no matter what good reason you have, people will not trust you. Boy, what an eye-opener. You know, I mean, it's just an eye-opener to get that kind of information and to know it's probably, it's probably true. And then we end up with the last conflict, compromise, and change, predictability, cooperation, and continuity. Now, the essence of what I'm trying to say is I make this contrast here between political logic and administrative logic is the following. You wear administrative lenses. I am wearing political lenses. I can't help it. I look at your world through my lenses. You are looking at your world through my lenses. If I expect your world to conform to mine, I'm going to be disappointed. If you expect your world and your view, your worldview to, co to correlate with mine, you're going to be disappointed. And so what we need is people who can translate. And that's where the political astuteness comes in. The understanding that just because you use the same words does not mean you are speaking the same language. Now we'll have some time for questions. Um, I'm going to go just through the um, through these <coughs> rules and summary, and then be glad to take questions and comments for the remaining uh, ten minutes or so. These are some of the words that I use to describe the roles of the people who are working in the middle. Translate the logic of politics and administration. In other words, translate the stories, the anecdotes, the bits and pieces, the conflict, translate them into problems to be solved. Translate the problems to be solved, expand them so that we have some values options that the council can work with. Bridge, translate, bridge, align the gap between what's politically acceptable, administratively sustainable, align staff priorities with governing body goals and governing body and staff expectations. Okay, this is the summary. Bridging the gap is essential to good governance. The role of the governing body is community building. If I ever run for local office again, this is my campaign slogan. Honor the past, capture the present, shape the future. Good politics is about values, not right answers. Stories matter. Do not ignore any value over a period of time. It will come back to haunt you. 
The democratic process is messy. Politics and administration are ways of thinking. The role of the translator or bridge builder is critical. And aligning staff and governing body expectations is crucial. Thank you all very much. respond to any questions or comments and we can continue this in the breakout session as well. Thank you John. Uh, that, uh, we have some, uh, I think, some very good information that, uh, that will help, help us take back our communities and think about how we might uh, present information to decision makers. I'd be happy to uh, take the microphone anyway. Have a question. I got a question. Just very quickly, we've got several members in this room I know personally who want to become those translators that you're talking about. You know, how do you develop those skill sets to become that translator when we spend a lot of our time down in the technical aspects of our job? I don't know if you go out to school, or you, is it just time, experience, etc. Okay. So the, the first, uh, uh, first of all, there's no, there's no set answer there, okay? But here's what I would do. The first thing I would do is to try in some way to get an understanding of who the department, who the council, or who the chief administrative officer considers the most effective department heads working, who work with council. That's the first thing, okay? And then trying to figure out, okay, what is it they do? And so if there are opportunities to shadow them, if there are opportunities to model them, these are the kinds of things that become very, very important. I know, for example, that in some jurisdictions, there, are, there actually are provisions to have internal exchanges or internal internships so, for example, promising employees have an in, quote unquote internship in the chief administrative officer's office. So they get a flavor for that kind of that kind of thing. Other questions? In Wake County, we are going through a similar process, except our gap is not between the political side and the administration, it's between the departments and county administration. And so almost like a training ground for that next gap, we actually call ourselves translators. And so how do we explain um, what departments want and what they need at, up to the administration so that they can get what they want and what they need? And so it's kind of... Okay. Um, information flows up and flows down that they need assistance in making everyone understand. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so I, I think, you know, you have to have some kind of conversation about this, right? But the key is how do you structure that conversation? And the way I would structure a conversation like that, there is a, um, there's a classical, um, a concept called the psychological contract. And the psychological contract exists between any two parties. So you can take what you said, this level and this level. And what, in order to have that conversation, what you want to know is, what does party A, or level A, expect or need from party B in order for party A to be able to do its work effectively? What does party B need from party A in order to do its work effectively? What is party A willing to provide to party B in order for party B to do its work effectively? What is party B willing to provide? And you actually make lists. And you do this with both parties in the room at the same time. You make lists, and now, in effect, if people agree, 
you now have a psychological contract, and now you have the basis for a conversation, which is, okay, which of the expectations do we do, a best, best, or do the best job fulfilling? Which of the expectations do we have to pay more attention to? What are the obstacles to, it's that kind of conversation, but you need a structure to be able to have that conversation. And then ultimately, what you want to start to do, and this is a way off, you want to, you want to put, you want to put the working in the gap, you want to figure out what are the competencies, see, that really shine for people who do well working in the gap. In order to, to work in the gap, you need to be able to A, B, C, D, and then what we need to do is start building those into job descriptions. See, there, we have a ways to go. Yeah, see, and you're, you're, you're playing with this stuff. That's what you're doing. And it's probably pretty frustrating. Um, yeah, I have a question about as you've been observing politicians and administrations across many years. It seems to me that there's a growing complexity, obviously, in, in how governments do their work, and especially what politicians have to decide. And I'm just curious, as that complexity grows, it's been my observation that politicians tend to orient themselves more and more to stories. They need nuggets that they hang on to desperately, yes. rather than esoteric dissertation by yes. administration. Yes. And do you see that growing? I, I, I see it, and I'm, I'm concerned about it. And how do, you, how do you get politicians to begin to trust you outside of just basic translation? OK. So um, it reminds me of what the performance auditor in Kansas City, Missouri, who later became the mayor of Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, he, had, he and I got along pretty well. And uh, he had heard this discussion of stories. And what he started to do was he started to include anecdotes in his performance uh, 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 reports. Uh, so performance audits. So he would make a point, and then he'd have data. But before that section, he'd have a little anecdote. OK? Now, I, was, I have been bothered by the increasing emphasis in administrative circles about the importance of storytelling. Because I associate storytelling with politics, OK? But I think I am, I've reached a satisfactory uh, answer to my own question of the frustration, which is the following. Politicians tell stories that may have no basis in fact. It's possible. It's like, I mean, how many times, it, I don't know about you, but I got so tired of we get, a, we get a request, put in a stop sign at the corner of blah, 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 and blah, 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 okay? We have all this discussion. The city engineer goes out, does traffic counts, whatever. And one council member comes back when we're discussing and says, I drove down that street the other day and I didn't see very much traffic. I don't think we need a stop sign. Hello? One time, one incident, and you're now going to, okay? But see, that doesn't stop the politician, because the politician doesn't have to have that level of discipline. Now, we can distinguish, okay, between effective politicians and ineffective politicians, because I'm not saying every politician is effective. Okay, if I'm sitting on the council with that, with that elected official and he says, I drove down that street and I don't think, that guy loses my respect immediately, okay? There's a difference, however, in the stories that, that accompany administrative work. Those are less stories than they are examples. So they have to be grounded in data plans and reports. Okay, now we are illustrating the data plans and reports. If you want to read about it, fine. 
This, is a, this, this captures it for us. It's not an isolated incident. The political story could be an isolated incident. Okay? Good. Okay, I think we're about... I think we've got time for one more question. Anyone has one? All right, I'll turn it over to Josh for a wrap up and notes on the next session. Thank you.